Cool, excellent. Okay, so um, yeah, we're Graham and Christine Whitehouse. Um, we, we run a little um, teaching business to teach people about foraging um, uh, called Whitehouse Foraging. It took us ages to work out the title, um, but, uh, and I even had to marry Christine to make sure it worked for both of us. So um, last May, we actually tied the knot after a few years of um, jointly foraging. Um, I'm gonna take you onto the first slide and uh, tell you a little bit more about us. Um, so I mentioned that we got married last year um, and um, we, we've been um, together now since 2013. Christine on our second date took us out mushroom foraging, uh, which was my first ever mushroom forage. And I have to say um, it inspired us both and um, we just continued to find more and more ways to learn more and more about what's available out in the countryside and on the seashores. So um, over a period of years, we've, we've learned lots, um, but what we find is we love to tell other people about it as well, because it's so exciting when we're out and we find some wonderful foods that we wanted to make sure that other people hear as well. And, and, and that's why we got into teaching. Um, there's lots of reasons why we forage, um, and I think um, for us, the, the number one reason is that uh, we enjoy the foods uh, and the drinks, probably not in that order. Um, we, um, we make lots of stuff. Um, you'll see here just a selection of things that looks nice and colorful. Um, as you go around, we've got uh, the fluorescent pink, uh, which is um, a rose bay willow herb flower jam. Um, which is um, quite honey-like and uh, more amazingly um, uh, look, looked like it was from a nuclear um, fallout somewhere. Um, we uh, certainly enjoy our wine, um, so it's the our last batch of elderberry, um, which is very port-like in its flavour. Um, we made some honeycomb uh, with some sea buckthorn berries to give it a nice little uh, extra flavour. Um, recently, um, we uh, thought we'd have a little go at Cherry Bakewells. Um, one of our foraging friends um, had put up a post to say they'd made hawthorn um, flower cordial and that they'd then used that cordial because it was quite almond-like to make uh, uh, the, the base of a, a, a cake and actually it was gorgeous, wasn't it? It was beautiful. Yeah. Um, Crackers, we, we make all sorts of different crackers, but just add seeds and wild garlic and anything else that you can put in. Um, but um, they, they make a nice sort of tasty addition to your, at your day. Um, Christine? Made a sweet curd uh, for you, like a, it's like a jam. It's quite difficult to make without tasting. Uh, if you, some people like it, it's like Marmite because it has a slight TCP-like taste. Some people like it, some people don't. But um, quite easy to make, so that's meadow sweet, my uh, curd. Yeah, and, and the meadow sweet is just up at the moment. So if, if you see any um, sort of creamy uh, white flowers on, on about a two or three foot um, stand, um, you, you'll find um, if, if you have a smell of them that they've got a beautiful smell. But as Christine said, there is that sort of um, medicinal sort of um, taste if you get any of the stalks uh, with them as well but um, the, the, the curd was very tasty, it worked really well. And then um, any number of different cordials. Um, so um, elderflower is obviously just coming to the end of season now. Um, rose hip, um, there's all sorts you can do. We, we will actually show you uh, or talk you through very briefly how to make a cordial um, at the end of this um, chat. So yes, yeah, so that's one of the reasons, food and drink, um, but there are other reasons why we forage. Um, another one is um, just to be have a real excuse to get out into the uh, wild. Um, you know, on the left there, you'll see we've got a whole um, field or woodland full of parasol mushrooms. We, we've spotted those when we were in France, um, and they were unfortunately the other side of a fence. And uh, in, in France, a fence is a really important thing, so we didn't go across and pick those, but we couldn't help but take a nice photo. Uh, and we just like nature generally, so any excuse to get out is well worthwhile. We also find that you slow down when you are out for a walk and you're out for a sh what, what seems a short time and you've actually gone out for hours and hours. Yeah, and, and, and that slowing down allows you to see things that you might otherwise miss if you're, if you're in your normal rush. 
And again, this is one of our sort of um, well-being benefits of foraging. Um, you'll see here an absolutely superb um, sort of design on the um, uh, raspberry leaf that I spotted last year. Uh, and uh, perhaps a little bit gruesome for some, um, but uh, some uh, a little nest of caterpillars that were tucked into some hedgerow that we saw too. Um, just you, because of that slowing down, you're just seeing more and more stuff. We don't eat the caterpillars, just to, <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> yes, thank you for clarifying. Um, other reasons? Um, well, I think one of the things we didn't expect when we started foraging was to um, realise how much we might learn. Um, we both baked cakes in the past, but you start learning um, new ingredients to add to them. So like the sea buckthorn cakes on the left. Um, we've recently, um, again, taken a lead from another forager locally, um, made some nettle rennet so that we could actually make cheese. And um, we, we managed to um, sort of produce this on our first attempt at cheese making, which we're very pleased with. Um, we've um, smoked fish um, using wild mushroom powder, um, seaweed powder and various other sort of more um, normal ingredients as well. Uh, which has been a, a big sort of uh, improvement um, and we've also made sure we use every last scrap of things so even apple peel we've used to make apple cider vinegar so yeah, and, and these are just a few of the skills that we've we've been trying out and learning over the years <clears throat> final one on here was um, we, we thought we'd try not using tin foil um, when we were cooking. Uh, so we used some kelp um, uh, seaweed and used that to wrap up around a piece of pork fillet and we tucked in some uh, pickled wild garlic into one of the fillets and we tucked in some um, garlic wild pest. garlic pesto into the other along with some wild mushrooms and then we wrapped them up and we baked them. And it was a little bit like a sort of a husband and wife bake-off because I said the wild garlic pickle would be good and Christine said the wild garlic pesto would be good so we had to have one of each to see who was best and, and which was tastiest. Funny enough each one got one vote so um, <laughs> draw your own conclusions about our competitive natures. So um, quite often people say well where do you find these things and um, we, we tend not to tell people um, if you go to this field in this corner of this Sort of garden you'll find these things. We, we tend to tell people about environments because I think it's important part of the process is actually going and finding your own environment to pick things. Um, so here's just a few examples. Um, uh, clearly woodland is quite handy um, for your mushrooms, uh, or for some of your mushrooms, uh, but also for your wild garlic and your um, wood sorrel. Um, and you'll see uh, various bits in here. So we've got some young wild garlic um, which quite enjoys the damp um, which this little stream is producing. Um, we've got wood sorrel which is not so easy to tell from this picture so sorry um, but you'll see little carpets of that in woodland. Um, your seashores um, for your seaweeds and, and some of your seafoods and then even as you start looking up in the trees you'll find um, things like chicken of the woods uh, and oyster mushrooms. So these, these were particularly huge. You can see the bike saddle just to the left and the size of these mushrooms, they were huge. <coughs> um, not only woodlands and trees, uh, but also if you look on some of the gravel paths, um, really sort of quite poor um, ground, you'll see things like this, which is your pineapple weed, um, which again, um, bizarrely by its name, um, it has got a pineapple taste and smell. Um, and we find that's a really good one for um, flavouring things like vodka um, and making a nice sort of pineapple flavoured drink. If you're going to the seashore, you can also be aware that different seaweeds grow at different parts of the shoreline. You must always make sure you pick the seaweeds that are still alive and have been under the water. Don't go for the scraggy stuff up at the top of the shoreline. But different seaweeds grow at different levels of the, of the seashore too. That's part of the learning process. And I think with seaweeds, just on that, if you are picking, uh, always make sure you cut them and leave at least a third of it attached to the rock that, that it was that it's currently growing on, so that it can 
reproduce again. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> um, we're going to uh, foraging uh, bizarrely, as you might expect, is uh, seasonal. So uh, we thought we'd give you a quick run through the four seasons uh, and give you a, an insight into some of the things that you can pick at different times. So um, this first picture here um, shows again the young um, wild garlic and also wild leek mixed in. Um, it's still fairly young there, but it won't be long before that's um, eminently pickable. And uh, then as you come over here, you can see just how um, sort of close together the, um, the wild garlic grows. You do get sort of quite um, dense patches of it. Um, but I think when you see it like that, it becomes very sort of easy to just pick by the handful. And we wanted just to show down here, right in the center of one of those wild garlic plants, there's another plant growing. And though this isn't wild garlic, uh, this is and my brain's just gone. Dog mercury. This is dog mercury, which is uh, which poisonous. is a poisonous one. So grabbing by the handful could easily pick out something you don't want. So um, when you're foraging, just take care to select what you're picking quite um, uh, deliberately, rather than just grab by the handful. The wild garlic and the wild leek are quite easy to identify as well, especially by their taste and their smell. The wild leek, though, we had somebody who brought us a bunch of what she thought was wild leek and very proudly saying, look, I found some wild leek and had to look at it. And as soon as I opened up to smell it, it was evident it wasn't wild leek at all because the wild leek has a very strong sort of oniony smell and this did not have it. So it was probably something like a, perhaps a bluebell or a, a crocus leaf that she had just thought it was because it was the shape of a wild leek and it wasn't. Yeah, so it's important to use the... the your sense of smell as well as your sight, definitely. Okay, um, I'm gonna roll on. Uh, staying in the spring, um, there are lots of other things apart from wild garlic and wild leek. Um, here's a few just to give you some examples. Um, over here on the left, we have um, some garlic mustard or hedge garlic or jack by the hedge, depending on what name you want to know it by. Um, this, uh, the leaves of this have quite a garlicky taste um, and quite a pleasant garlicky taste. Um, the stem is much more like mustard and if you've got a bit um, that you can actually dig up, um, this is in our garden so I'm allowed to dig this one up, um, the um, root actually tastes rather like horseradish, it's got a really good sort of powerful punch to it so um, all, all parts re really usable. Um, you, you have uh, your um, yeah. hairy bittercress uh, down here. You see the very sort of distinct rosette. Um, this is available, you can normally find this most of the year, but um, the sort of late winter, early spring is a good time to be picking it. Um, and it, sort of, as the name suggests, tastes like cress. Um, up here, you've got your ground elder. This is a very young one, just starting to push through. Um, but uh, again, a very sort of tasty spring salad green. Um, Christine also put some into a pakora mix as well when she makes a pakora for us, so um, good tasty one. It's also a good parsley substitute as well, why buy parsley when you can go and get ground elder in the springtime. The best leaves to pick are when they're just young and they're shiny and that's your, the best, the optimum time to pick them. Yeah, they get a bit tough when they're older. Um, the final pictures on there are dandelion and um, dandelion leaves when they're young and very sort of fresh green looking um, make a, a good addition to your salads in spring. Um, the flowers, um, apart from being really good for bees, um, are also good for making a, a nice syrup um, and also for making a nice wine. Um, so um, you can use those in various ways. You can use the leaves in your salad, but just be aware they are quite bitter. The best ones to pick are the ones that are growing in the shade because once they're in the sun that tends to bring out the bitterness even more. Of course you wouldn't eat a whole bowl full of them anyway, you would add them to a salad like as you add, you add rocket and add them to other salad leaves. So there is so much in the spring, we've got quite a few slides here but um, here's a, again one of our favourites. Um, this is part of the carrot family as is the ground elder from the previous slide. Um, this is sweet Sicily. Um, and it does look like um, a number of the carrot um, family, but it's got some very clear distinguishing features. 
if you see these little white marks that look a little bit like a bird's uh, drop, uh, a little bit like bird droppings, um, then um, you know you're on the right plant. Um, if you were to break a little piece of it off and smell it, you would get a lovely sort of aniseedy flavour. I say lovely, not everybody likes aniseeds, but I do. Um, and if you're really lucky, a little bit later in the season, you'll also find the seeds, which are, um, I find, just a great little sweet to eat as you're um, passing through the woodlands. But you could take them home and candy them and make them into some little um, boiled sweets as well. Um, we tend to steer clear of medicines and health claims, but um, one that we do use is the, uh, the daisy salve. Um, if you collect your daisies, um, pop them into some olive oil, put them on a sunny windowsill, leave them for a week or so, uh, then strain the daisies off and away. The oil that you're left with um, is a great rub if you've got um, bruises or bumps or anything that just need a little bit of um, a salve. Um, it, it's sort of, I suppose, a little bit like Arnica, if anybody knows Arnica. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we also um, find a few mushrooms at this time of the year. So, uh, oh, sorry, I've just, I've just moved on. Just bear with me a moment. There you go. So um, up here we have um, jelly ears. Um, these uh, tend to grow mainly on um, elder, um, but they will grow on other trees as well, but it's mainly elder that you find them. Um, when it's dry, there'll be little tiny husks that you'll hardly notice, but if it's been wet or damp for a few days, you will find them sort of grown to um, good ear size and ear shape. Uh, really good, a good one to add to stir fries and the like. Uh, and then we've got some little tiny oyster mushrooms here, um, which uh, are a little bit too young to pick yet, but uh, that was a nice surprise to find those when we were out um, back in the early spring. Um, and then finally, just up here, um, it looks like a bit of litter, but actually this is us collecting birch sap. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so again, on this one, we actually tapped into a birch tree. This was a couple of years ago. Um, but now, um, we, instead of tapping into the tree trunk, we tend to just take a, a clip off of a, a thin branch um, and um, put the bottle over the branch, and that, that's less invasive for the, the tree, less damaging. <coughs> Excuse me. As we move out of spring and into summer, um, there are still more mushrooms. Um, we have um, over on the left here, um, a dryad saddle, this is quite a young one. Um, so I'm just trying to get my pointer up, but it's not showing. <coughs> uh, these are quite tasty when they're young, um, but uh, as they get older, they get quite hard and um, unpalatable, and you can really only use them for tea at that stage. But a uh, very pretty mushroom as well, sometimes known as a pheasant back for the design of the, of the top. <coughs> In the middle here, you have your common hogweed. The marker's not working. I like to collect the young shoots of the common hogweed in the springtime, in early summer, and then fry it into a tempura batter. They're very, very tasty. The, the taste is difficult to describe. It's quite a unique taste. Um, it's, one, it's certainly one of my favourite uh, vegetables of the, of the springtime. Just be aware of the difference between common hogweed and giant hogweed. The giant hogweed obviously is very dangerous and it can burn, the sap will burn you. The common hogweed is its cousin, so it can be nasty. You have to treat it with respect and very careful. When you are picking it, don't pick it on a, on a hot sunny day or the sap could burn you. And don't take too many from the one plant. Plants speak to each other underground, so if they are being attacked, one can warn the other. And by the time you get to the end of the row, the last one may uh, be producing sap, which can burn you. If you are, t are at all concerned, you can just wear rubber gloves to collect it. I also make it into a pakora, and I add other sprinklings to the pakora, so you can put in your wild garlic, your hedge garlic, your ground elder, anything you like, into your pakora. <clears throat> and then uh, we have up in the top corner, uh, again, just some chicken of the woods. Uh, I think I've managed to double up on the chicken in the, of the woods, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on. 
So um, getting into the summer proper, uh, most of us have know of the berries that are available. So um, you will find cherries, they're, they're out and about just now. Um, raspberries are starting to show. Um, and also you'll find the, um, the small uh, wild strawberries, which again are really lovely, but you just have to sort of try and spot those in the undergrowth. Um, but um, definitely we're, we're hitting fruit season now. <coughs> Excuse me. Some of the other things you'll see sort of spring summertime um, here on the left um, is another um, a carrot family member. This is uh, one known as pig nut and uh, it's really difficult to tell but down at the so as you follow the stalk down you can sort of see the very thin um, leaves that it's got on it, very thin, uh, narrow leaves, um, and the, uh, the white flower umbel. If you've got landowner's permission, which you need to dig up any plant, um, you can um, follow this plant down into the ground and dig down with a little stick or a knife or whatever you've got, and just keep following the, um, the, the root as it goes down until you find um, your prize, which is these, um, the pig nut. Now these are a real delicacy, they're very tasty, um, sort of a carroty, nutty flavour to them, um, and well worth the sort of few minutes of careful digging to get down to them. Um, the only thing you need to be careful of is that um, you always make sure you keep the plant attached as you work your way down, because there are other things that may be in the ground, um, such as for example, bluebell uh, bulbs that um, you might pick by mistake if, you, if you've not followed your plant down to the root. Uh, bluebells wouldn't do you so much good as, uh, as the, uh, the pig nut. Um, in addition um, to those, we've, we've, we're now into the season of um, the fireweed. Oh, I've done it again, sorry. Uh, fireweed, this one over here on the right. Um, you'll see, see, oh, <laughs> right, just bear with me a moment. Perhaps while you're sorting that out, Graham, I can ask uh, one of the questions and uh, possibly uh, one of you could answer. Um, so Alison was asking, by wild leek, do you mean the three-cornered leek? Is that the same thing? It, yes. there's, there's a couple of varieties, <clears throat> yeah. Three-cornered leek is one. And um, few-flowered leek. And few-flowered leek is the other. So, um, it just depends which one you've got, but both are edible, um, both very tasty. I think we tend to get the few flowered leek up here off the top of my head, um, oh, rather, rather than the three cornered, but um, yeah, that's what we mean, yeah. <clears throat> cool, okay, well, we seem to be back up. Hopefully everyone can see this again now. Um, no. so you might no. need to share your screen again. All right, okay, just bear with me. <clears throat> yeah, so um, we were just talking about the fireweed um, or rose bay willow herb up in the top right hand corner. Um, so this is, um, we, we, we made that sort of fluorescent jam from those flowers um, we showed you earlier. Um, but um, the real sort of um, joy of the rose bay willow herb for us is the tea making. Um, back in the 18th century, it was Russia's second biggest export, um, Tsar Chai. Um, and they used to export the dried leaves um, so that we could all use it as tea. Um, nowadays it's not so well used, but um, I think it's got a bit of a resurgence based on people we speak to. Um, but if you collect the leaves off of this plant, um, sweat them in a, a bag or under tarpaulin, depending on the size that you're making, um, for a, a day or a week, depending on how green or black you want to make your tea. Uh, and then dry them and store them, you've got your tea leaves, um, which can be either a base for other teas or, or a tea in its own right. Um, and a very sort of tasty um, uh, drink as well. You can also make a syrup with the flowers as well. And when the rosebe willow herb is emerging in the springtime, you can use the tips of that. It's supposed to be like a sort of asparagus type um, plant taste. Right, I can just move you through the summer into the autumn. Uh, we're, we're sort of, we're not quite there yet, but we are already starting to see a few of the um, sort of summer autumn mushrooms appearing. Um, so um, the, these are some of the ones you might see sooner than, well, most of these are the ones you'll see sooner. 
Um, so here we have um, the brown birch bolete and beside it the orange birch bolete. Um, these um, uh, are what's known as a, a mycorrhizal um, mushroom. They, they actually work with the birch tree um, to bring more nutrients to the tree. Uh, and then the tree is a little thank you um, releases some of its sugar for the mushroom to, to use. So a nice uh, symbiotic relationship going on between them. Um, both mushrooms are really tasty. I think the orange is slightly better than the brown, um, but they're both a really tasty, meaty mushroom. Um, so well worth, um, well worth a look. Um, they're a little bit different to the ones you pick in the shops. Um, in as much as they've, um, they've actually got um, tubes underneath, uh, which looks like a big sponge, uh, instead of having gills. Um, and, and that's uh, the way that they release their spores, is down through those tubes. Um, but um, if you find a mushroom that looks like it's got a sponge underneath the, um, the, the top, um, there's a more chance that it's going to be an edible one. That there are a few that aren't edible, but most, most you can eat, certainly after cooking. Um, down in this corner, we've got um, another um, edible bolete. Um, this is a scarlatina. These are really beautiful looking mushrooms and quite scary looking as well. Um, when you bruise them, they turn blue. Um, and you'll see underneath the, uh, the tubes on these are a lovely sort of orangey red colour. Um, absolutely beautiful looking mushroom. And if you slice into them, the flesh goes from yellow to blue in, in really a blink of an eye. Um, and then when you cook them, they go back to yellow. So um, quite an interesting one. We find with mushrooms as well, there's, there's lots of people that like to try and apply rules to mushrooms. There's only run, one rule that seems to apply right across the board. Uh, and that is, if you're not 100% sure it's what you think it is, don't eat it. Um, every other rule, there seems to be an exception. And one of the rules that we hear quite often and, and still read quite often is that if the mushroom turns blue when you cut it, that you can't eat it. Uh, in actual fact, there are some mushrooms that turn blue that you can't eat and some that you can. And this is one of the good ones. Um, over in the top right hand corner, um, we've got um, a chanterelle, top of a chanterelle. And underneath it, we've got the top of a false chanterelle. Now side by side, you can see a bit of difference in the colour, um, but uh, if you're out in the field um, uh, picking and you only had false chanterelles, you might have to look twice before you were sure what you were collecting. Um, there are a few other sort of um, points that you can pick up on um, identification, but uh, I'm afraid that's the only photo I've got, so I can't show you the others immediately on here. <clears throat> okay, just carry on through autumn. Uh, again, in the autumn, you've got a lot of the berries um, and nuts appearing as well. So um, here on the left, you've got uh, a beautiful uh, rose hip. Um, they make a great syrup. Um, we, we, um, uh, well, as, a, as a child, I used to get given rose hip syrup to increase my vitamin C. Um, nowadays, I, I still take it because it's such a tasty um, uh, cordial. Um, but we've also got in, in our right hand picture, um, starting at the bottom, we've got some um, hazelnuts. Uh, we have some um, rowan berry, uh, which uh, they're quite bitter um, when they're used, but um, uh, we find that they make a nice jelly to go with game or with cheese or, or the oh. like. So um, quite, quite tasty jelly. In the middle, we've got some elderberries, um, which again, are really good for throats. So if, if you've got a sore throat or you, you think you might be going down with a cold, um, elderberry is great. Um, but you can't eat the, or you shouldn't eat the berries raw. They, they are mildly toxic. So um, it's always better to um, sort of cook them first and either make them into a juice or a cordial or, or a vinegar. Um, Again, we, we, I think one of our staple foods through the year is the elderberry vinegar. It's a really tasty one. Uh, we've also got at the top of the um, page there, we've got some hawthorn berries. Again, we make a nice catch up with those. Um, it's a, a long and laborious job, but is actually worth it. So um, uh, I, I, I let Christine do that every year. <laughs> 
and uh, brambles. Oh, and of course, yeah, mustn't forget the brambles. Um, you know, they, they, are, they get a bit overlooked as a bit too easy to pick and find, but um, they are really tasty and um, Christine's favourite way, I'll let you tell everyone. My favourite thing to do with the brambles, apart from making bramble jelly, is to make the bramble whiskey, which is a very easy process, which if you want to know, we can talk about that afterwards. As a non-whiskey lover, I absolutely adore bramble whiskey. <laughs> so then we get into the winter and, and it's a little bit harder to find um, so much food when we get into the winter, um, but there are still a few mushrooms around. Um, on the left hand side here we've got uh, a winter chanterelle, uh, sometimes known as a yellow leg. If you can imagine looking down into some uh, undergrowth and seeing a, a horrible looking brown topped mushroom, you might wonder surely this isn't edible. But actually um, if you put your hand on it and feel the texture, they've got a wonderful sort of rubbery feel to them, uh, quite sort of uh, firm. Um, and as soon as you put your hand on it, you know that you're on the right sort of mushroom. And, uh, uh, you'll normally find a, a nice little patch when you find one you'll find quite a few others really tasty and it's probably the last tasty mushroom we find in the season um, well worth seeking out over the winter um, you will find things like the one in the middle um, and my brain's just gone velvet shank thank you the velvet shank um, you'll see here they look a bit sort of jelly like on the top um, these are quite young ones uh, but you'll see underneath the bottom photo um, that they've got sort of um, almost like literally velvety um, stems. The stems aren't really edible, they're a bit tough, um, but the, the tops can be eaten. Um, but you, you're sort of scratching around a little bit to find a, a decent portion. And then on the right, you'll see um, the start of the elf cups uh, coming through from the, the end of the winter into the spring. Um, these are wonderful little red, uh, they bring a, a nice bit of colour to your plate uh, and they can be eaten raw as well. So we, we sometimes just have a little bit of wild garlic and an uh, elf cup while we're out just as a little snack. The other thing we tend to do in the winter is get out and collect some seaweed. Um, from about sort of end of January onwards, um, it's quite a good time to go and collect. So. Um, again, um, we've got uh, on the left the truffle of the sea, the uh, um, pepper dulse um, in the middle on our washing line. Um, I'm not sure it's going to dry much there at the minute, but um, uh, looking at the rain behind. But um, this is uh, dabalox, again, a nice sort of tasty seaweed. We tend to dry these um, and then powder them and then just add them to various foods that we're eating. Uh, and then on the right, um, we've got lava, and this looks a little bit like an oil slick sort of. A, a, draped over the rocks um, and this is a, a great uh, tasty food. Um, you, you collect this, uh, try and take as little sand with you as possible, um, wash it about half a dozen times when you get home to get the rest of the sand off and then you cook it slowly in a slow cooker for about 12 to 24 hours and you end up with this wonderful marmitey, bovrily sort of looking yes. paste. Uh, which is just full of flavour and um, you can make things like lava bread with it, um, add it to oats and fry it, particularly fried in bacon fat is absolutely gorgeous. <clears throat> so I said so I'd just very quickly talk you through making cordial um, because if you know the basics of how to make a cordial you can uh, apply it to lots of different um, foraged um, plants. So. This was our rose petal cordial that we made earlier in the season. Um, you see the nice dog rose petals. Um, if you're looking for your own roses, um, you can taste pretty much any of the rose petals because they're, they're not poisonous. Uh, and when you smell and taste the one that you like the flavor of, take that away to make your cordial or whatever else you're making. Um, this one um, tastes and smells of Turkish delight and it's absolutely gorgeous. So very simply, get a few handfuls of petals, um, cover them in water, bring it to the boil and then let that water cool down and you'll see that the colour sort of slowly seeps out of the petals and into your water. Um, you then um, take out the strain off the petals, add an equivalent amount of sugar um, to the uh, remaining water uh, and then bring it back to the boil 
and get it into some um, clean um, sterilized bottles. And then when you've finished, you, you'll end up with something that looks like this on the left, beautiful color um, and beautiful flavor. We've made things like meringues using the, um, the, the cordial. Um, and we also um, like to top it into our sweet Sicily fizz as a little uh, sweetener, very tasty. And it keeps for a long time. It'll keep for a few months, certainly. We've actually got a bottle that's two years old and we've kept it in the fridge and it's still absolutely fine. Yeah, no, it's good. So um, we've, um, we've given you a bit of an insight into why we forage and what we forage and where we forage. And um, we thought we'd give you a chance to ask some questions. So hopefully you've got a few. We'll, we'll come out of this and uh, come back and face you. There we go, we're back. <laughs> Phew, back in the room. <laughs> One thing we didn't get a chance to see was um, because foraging is so seasonal, you try and preserve as much as you can throughout the year so that you've got stuff to keep you going throughout the year as well. And we've got a vast array of stuff that we have preserved and we can tell you about how to preserve certain things and keep them so you've got, got to be tastes for throughout the year. Just before we uh, go into questions, I wonder if you would say a, a couple of words about like, the forager's code, take what you need yeah. and, all that, and protected species. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's really important that um, you, you, know, you, you don't um, just go and strip areas. Um, there's, you see lots of um, sort of concern about the way foragers seem to go in and Sort of take an area completely from top to bottom and, and leave nothing behind. Um, it, to my mind, and I think to people in the Association of Foragers particularly, and probably many others, um, it's really important to help nature expand rather than contract. So, uh, you know, for example, um, this, this wasn't pre-planned, but I happen to have um, just just here. Um, this is one of our mushroom bags, and you'll see the bottom of it um, is made of string um, or mesh. Mm -hmm. So when we put our mushrooms in, um, the spore can drop. So wherever we're wandering with our picked mushrooms, we're actually sort of helping to spread the spores around the rest of the wood. So um, it's really important um, that we enhance and improve our environment rather than make it worse as we go around. So um, you know always leave some for nature, always leave some for other foragers. Um, and as you say,
Does anybody do any foraging at the moment? Yes, I, know. I guess everyone does. They just don't know it. Like you say, picking blackberries or picking brambles, that's foraging. Yeah, it um, is. Who, who can resist going just tasting a blackberry whenever you find one? Exactly, exactly. But it is, it's very difficult to do it online when you've just been showing photographs. You've actually got to get out and actually see the plant, feel it, smell it, and that's how you learn about it. It's really hard from photographs. Yeah. Um, we appreciate that. So it is better to go out on a walk at some point yeah. in the future if you can. Yeah. Get, a, get a good field guide as well. Um, like food, food for free is a is a cracking book and I think hasn't been out of print since 1974 when it was first published. But it's a great yeah. little book, tiny little. Oh, I've got it somewhere. I don't know if it's in the. No, it's, it's somewhere. It's in a bag or a pocket somewhere. Um, yeah. No, very yeah. good. And um, there's, there's quite a few in the River Cottage series that oh, I, yeah. I find good as well. Um, and um, Oh, there's, there's more and more actually if everywhere you look there seems to be more and more <coughs> excuse me foraging books coming out which i, I guess is a, a bit of an indication that it's it's uh, you know a, a flourishing um sort of interest for people um and which we're really pleased about to be fair just because it, it feels right to do it you know so yeah, yeah. And, uh, i do have a, a link from the association of foragers that is um uh, last month's e-zine or magazine about uh, foraging is beautifully put together. It's a really, really nice looking uh, looking uh, location. Yeah, so I'll, I'll yeah. give a, a link to that as well. So check out the Association of Foragers as well. Um, I'd best start writing down all these links that I'm going to put into a, in, into an email, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. In fact, I've got it open, so I'll put the link to that in the chat just before we go. So you can click on that and then that'll take you to it and, and you can have that. Um, Alison says she, she's out foraging almost every day, uh, about to pick some mugwort today. Excellent, well, very good. Yeah, yeah. What well, um, can I ask what you use it for? Is it uh, teas or um, or other? What well, was well, she's typing there? Is pickled, uh, I picked lots and um, made loads this year, made lots of things, edibles medicinally, I have a few things ready uh, to strain. Oh, wow, well, on it, on it, Alison. Excellent. Yeah, no, very good. Yeah, I like it. One thing we didn't mention was when you are foraging to make sure that you are picking what you think you're picking, making sure you have identification. People are often terrified of mushrooms because there's there's poisonous mushrooms, but there are equally deadly plants out yeah. there as well. You've got hemlock, hemlock water drop wart, and there's a the lily. The, I can't what it's called, yeah. but there's a, there's a, a lily that's um, looks very like sorrel. Um, which can be mistaken for sorrel. So there are dangerous um, plants out there as well. So always be very, very careful yeah. and making sure you've got what you think you've got. I had, uh, that's, that's a good point. I, I had a chap on one of my mentoring calls who we were talking about some garden plants as well. So I mentioned nasturtiums being a nice sort of bright plant. He wanted to sort of look at some drinks he was uh, making. I said, well, you know, there, there's a real colourful one if you want to really put something vibrant. So he went out, and, and I did say you won't, you're very unlikely to find them in the wild. So um, a, a little while later, I had a, a photo sent over of a poppy uh, with a, I found nasturtiums um, caption underneath it. Um, and it turned out he'd actually tried eating this poppy um, with, and made his mouth go um, sort of quite numb with it. So um, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's a frightening world when, when you're not 100% certain that I try and instill in everyone it's so important to be 100%, not 99.9, not 100% .9, sure you've got the plant that you believe you've got and just spend the time learning it. And if you're not sure, we, we've picked things thinking it's a particular plant or a particular mushroom and we've gone through every identification way we can. And if we can't really be certain, we, we won't touch it. We'll, we'll, we'll put it away, throw it away. But we do our damnedest to try and identify it first. So um, it doesn't happen too often, but no. we, we won't we won't eat it if we're not totally sure. So but there are six thousand different types of mushrooms yeah, there's, there's in the UK, thousands, so yeah. it's, it's you can't know them all. Yeah. Um, no. So what you do is you just try and learn learn the basic ones first of all, and then expand your repertoire. But um, no, nobody knows them all. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, especially with the the carrots there as well. There's a lot of carrots that are. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess hemlock is that a carrot? It's, it, it is. Yeah, yes. hemlock and hemlock water dropwort. Um, both both carrots. So hemlock water dropwort looks a bit like and smells a bit like celery. Um, and uh, again, through the sort of foraging community, we, we've heard quite a number of stories of um, people um, taking home uh, wild celery for their meals and, and, um, wild parsnips. and, and, and then and then <laughs> and then being very ill. Um, so um, and you know, it's just you just have to be very careful that you know what you're doing. Um, if you do, then you can really enjoy it. It's it's a fantastic world to be in. Um, but just know when to stop and when to think. In my opinion, celery that you buy from the supermarket is poisonous anyway. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is, uh, there's a lot of people who feel the same way. But... A lot of people are allergic to celery as well. It's one, yeah. of the, the most, one of the most common allergies is a celery allergy. All right, I didn't know that. Yeah. Good. Uh, well, I, I've put in a link to the uh, to the Association of Foragers easy in there, which I'll I'll send out uh, in an email as well. Um, I guess if if there's no other questions, we can we can uh, start finishing off there. I did make a list of things that I need to say, um, uh, but before I do that, I'm just going to also share a uh, a link with you to a feedback form, um, and that would be really good if you could fill that out uh just so we can see see how that goes but um i, I think that was uh as a, a good success i think that was um probably as uh, as hands-on that we can get us foraging without actually going out foraging and so hopefully like say in the future we will be able to get out there and, and do some uh, some actual foraging walks because there, like graham says there really is nothing better than um uh, then actually going out there with an expert and they can show you what you can see and, and also like the environment because when you're picking plants and mushrooms and things you got to look around what's around you as well like with the symbiotic relationships it's good to see what trees are about or what uh, what, what your environment's like is this stagnant water is the flowing water things like that it's, it, it isn't just this plant is edible I'm going to eat it some, to some extent you can do that but it's, it's always good to see the experts and what they do.